All right, so uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, features about officers and how that uh, contributes to, to risk. Um, and this is an, an age-old question in uh, police, uh, police research. Um, Jim Fife is sort of a, a towering scholar in this field uh, while, while he was alive. What's that? Literally. Uh, he was also a very tall <laughs> person. Uh, I believe at the, his, at the end of his career, he was the uh, a deputy commissioner at MIPD and sort of rewrote all of their training materials based, after, based on a lifetime of research on, uh, on police, including police use of force. One of the things he always stumbled across is he was trying to tease apart, like, are there features of officers that make them more risky in some way? And so some of the things he would, and he kept coming across this problem, um, when you find an overrepresentation of minority officers among police shooters, well, they're also assigned differently, they're living in different places, and, they're, and you know, there's uh, this confounding going on. And this is a theme in numerous <laughs> research uh, so black officers are, in this case, not prominent in those uh, units most likely to see shooting action. Uh, blacks were posted to high-risk assignments far more, far more than whites, and this is a uh, work that, that Fife did later. But it's not just about race of officers, it's also about their age. You know, the, he finds some relationship between age and shooting risk, and that's about uh, you know, who's getting assigned where you know, by, by age. Um, Black officers draw more complaints, but is that because they're more aggressive, or is that because they're assigned to, 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 tougher, to tougher beats? Um, uh, getting more recent, 2007, same problems persisting. We got uh, factors such as college education. Are they more likely to encounter uh, resistant suspects may, that may account for why uh, education appears to matter in, in their research? Uh, based on, and, and this is just everything, Rank, time on the job, age, gender, may have been uh, assigned to less active areas, working areas with lower crime rates, or in a position that's le to less likely uh, to be in contact with the public. So this goes on and on. Researchers have been stumbling across this problem. So uh, I'm going to try to come up with a way to, to answer this. Uh, so um, this is, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about Chicago. Uh, this is a, 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 a shot of the um, Laquan McDonald shooting a few frames before uh, Officer Van Dyke uh, shoots Laquan McDonald uh, 16 times. And what I think is, why I put this up there is to point out that just nearly shoulder to shoulder with Officer Van Dyke is uh, Officer Walsh. And Officer Walsh does not shoot, doesn't shoot a, a, single, a single shot. Now, he's standing, you know, you know, maybe three feet over, and, uh, and um, Van Dyke made the decision to step maybe three feet forward. Uh, uh, Laquan McDonald does have a knife in his right hand at, at the time. And, uh, but in addition to Officer Walsh, there's other officers who are taking this video from, from their vehicle. There's another car back here with additional officers in them. But among all these officers on the scene, only Officer Van Dyke decides to step forward and then discharge six, 16 rounds. So what, what's, what's weighing on my mind is what's different about Officer Van Dyke? What did he, what, what was, is there, are there things about him that make him different from everyone else on, this, on the scene? Um, a, a, a related uh, incident, the, the, the incident that got me first involved in looking at police shootings is the, the Sean Bell uh, shooting in 2006 in New York City. Um, this is a diagram from the, uh, from the, from the investigation. Uh, five officers shot 50 rounds. Um, if you decide to spend the time and count the lines in this, uh, in this diagram, you will count 20 lines. Um, the remaining lines missed the car completely. Uh, so for those of you at, at tables who are talking about maybe maybe police should shoot uh, someone in the leg instead, or shoot the gun out of the hand. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to shoot. I mean, this is universal that, officer, that officers get training, but in that moment, uh, it is, it, their accuracy is, is not, that, not that great. Um, uh, some of the, the rounds in this case hit the, uh, the local, uh, uh, the train, the, the subway train, the elevated train in, in this neighborhood. Another one went to a living room, uh, hit other cars around. Um, but what's interesting is you see that there are five officers here. They differ in sort of their, their role, the, being a detective or an officer. They differ in, in age from you know, 28 to 39. 
Uh, they differ in the number of rounds fired, with uh, one detective firing one round, while Detective Oliver shooting 31 rounds, uh, emptying a uh, magazine, lo reloading another one, emptying that one as, as well. So uh, what is different about all of them? And you can see that, well, well, there's some white officers up here, and there's some black officers and white officers down here. They, the age range is spread across them. But I'd like to be able to figure out if there's something that puts you know, some feature about officers that makes them more likely to shoot more rounds. All right, so that's where we're, that's where we're, we're going with this. So both of these are, are interesting in that you have uh, several officers who are all in the same scene at the same time, facing the same subject, with the same lighting, with the same environment. Yes, one will be three feet to the right of the other, or looking one way, but I think some of those things are random. It's like someone showed up just uh, you know, 30 seconds later, uh, or the, the offender ran out the front door instead of the back door, or somebody was the driver that day rather than the passenger, um, uh, the officers. Um, so. Uh, that sort of eliminates a lot of confounding. They're all in the same scene, and now we'd like to try to, uh, t to tease apart what makes this different. Now, we can't tease anything apart from a single shooting. We can't learn just from the Laquan McDonald shooting or just from the Sean Bell shooting. But if we can compile enough information, uh, we can get at it. So what I'd like to do is be able to fit a model that's basically a, a logistic regression model of some kind that says, uh, what's the problem with the odds that uh, an officer shoots, that's uh, R equals 1, given uh, X and Z, and where X is features of the officer, and let me pull this out, so X is, includes officer features, age, race, sex, prior involvement, history of complaints, you know, performance, awards, uh, their, their assignments, all kinds of things about them, and I'm really interested in, in all the betas that are sitting in front of those X's, which ones elevate or decrease risk. Yes? Um, you don't have any interactions between the X's and the Z's. Is that sensible? I, I, I don't know. But in the interest <laughs> of time, <laughs> it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. Um, it, it is possible. Um, so Z uh, are all the things about the environment, you know, the, the time, place, context, lighting. And they're all the things that all the officers on the scene share together in that moment. And that includes the race of the individual who they, they are confronting. All right? And then H is some sort of unknown way of how all its environmental features in affect the, the, the risk. Now, the norm for police officers uh, are to uh, traverse their entire arc of their career without ever having to draw their firearms at all. So. That is the norm for most of the 800,000 police officers uh, in the country. So for most times and most places and for almost all Zs that, that ever happened, this is a large negative number. But every once in a while, the time, place, armed offender, nervous officer, uh, inexperienced officer, all those things come together and suddenly this sum uh, gets big and, and we get a shooting. Okay. So that's, that's the, the basic idea of the model. So uh, what, what do we do as statisticians? We need to sort of think through what a likelihood would look like. And if we could, say, sample moments in time and moments in space, right? Do a big random sample and ask at this particular point, you know, let's look at the officers in that moment. I'm not just talking about shooting moments, but like all moments. So uh, you know, an officer standing, you know, sniffing the flowers at the corner flower stand. And we count like, well, uh, which officers are, are in that time and space in that moment and, and collect their features X. Document Z about the lighting and what's going on and who's around. Uh, and then uh, these are the parameters that we need to estimate. And then what's the probability that in that moment with those, that collection of officers in that environment, we would observe officer one shooting uh, or not shooting, officer two shooting or not shooting, officer three shooting or not shooting. Okay. Very hard to pull this off, right? You've got to think about all these different moments. Uh, it's very difficult to document all the environmental features that might feed into uh, uh, the, the risk of, of shooting. Um, and then in most times and places, no one shoots. So you just have all these moments where not, nothing's happening. So um, in statistics, uh, um, if we can come up with a sufficient statistic, that is some summary of that moment, uh, then 
that, that likelihood can factor into two parts. One that has to do with a, the, a summary of the scene at that moment, okay? A statistic that collectively summarizes that moment. And a second term that talks about the individual actions of each individual officer. And there's a thing, if this statistic is special, then um, H will disappear from this second part. H and Z will disappear from this, this second part. And the trick is uh, to simply be able to figure out what that statistic is. And since at least the 70s, uh, we've known that uh, the sum of the R's is a sufficient statistic that will make this factorization possible. So what that means is that there are two discrete components that we can uh, separate. If we condition on the sum of the R's, that is the number of shooters at the scene, that gives sort of a level of risk for that moment. So let's say there's five officers on the scene. Sufficient statistic uh, is the number of shooters. Let's say three shooters uh, in that, out of those five officers on the scene. That sort of gives you a, a sufficient statistic for the level of risk of that moment. And that allows you to, to factor this into two parts. The second part is what's going to be really important for us, because it doesn't have that H or Z in it. All right. But note, we'll come back to this if I have time at the end, that there is a beta still up here. So there is some information still uh, in, that, in that term. All right. So what's important about that second term, if we focus just on that second term, and this is, uh, this is uh, the conditional likelihood, condition on that statistic for the sum of the, uh, of the, number, the, the, the number of shooters at that scene. Uh, technically, Kalbfleisch called this an approximate conditional likelihood because there is still a little bit of beta left in the, in the first term. But if we focus just on this, this uh, one term, uh, since the 70s, we've known that if you just use this term, you still get con uh, consistent estimates for, uh, for the, the, the beta. Um, and so note, what's important in this term is that you don't see the Z's at all, you don't see the H's at all, and I didn't simply just erase them or, or, <laughs> or cross them out or ignore them. Or it, the, if, even if you know Z or you don't know Z or you have H or don't know, uh, don't know H, you get the exact same answer for this. So knowing or not knowing what the environmental features are doesn't change the inference on, on beta at all. So this is, uh, this is particularly in, important um, uh, because you never ha actually have to, have to measure uh, uh, those, those, uh, that information. So long as you have multiple officers at the scene. Yes, so uh, it's just those, the moments that have one officer shoot or if all officers shoot, um, that, that turns into a one, and it contributes no information for, for beta. Right. Yep, real quick. Sorry, so um, you're basically assuming independence between the characteristics of the scene and the characteristics yes. of the officers by how you put this together, though. Right. And if you assume there's any interaction, as, as Professor Banks but it's, suggested. But it's the empirical process. These are the kinds of officers that show up at these kinds of scenes, and they're at that moment, and they're sharing that same moment, okay. and this is the kind of way some shootings shoot, roll so it's because out. It's conditional on the fact that you have focused. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, in addition, this can also work for counts as well. If you have the, so this is uh, you have the decision to shoot, yes or no, did you shoot or not? Um, and there's just a slight change. There's right. some factorial so, terms yeah. if you if you want to count like what's the, the, the probability of shooting five right. rounds versus four rounds versus three rounds, um, and the same property holds that the features of the environment uh, uh, factor out. I, All right. I have a question about there is a type of independence I'm concerned about here, which is that uh, I know that a lot of training for departments is that if your other officer shoots, you shoot. Um, yeah, so there, and, there is both and contagion and anti-contagion possibility here. Um, and I, at some point, convinced myself that it wouldn't affect the direction of my, uh, of my coefficient. It may affect the magnitude. magnitude. Um, and I just need, I do permutation tests to, to deal with. Uh, I see. Uh, um, is, is it possible to get information about who shot first, though? So, uh, <laughs> I, it is... Technically possible, I have, so have the, yeah. I, I'll talk through 
both New York <coughs> and another example where I don't know. So let's talk about uh, two, uh, two specific, uh, uh, one specific example just to make this, this concrete. Here are two uh, nearly identical officers. This is real data. And I found this one, because I, the, this pair, because I liked it so much. Because check this out. They, they, uh, they differ by one year of age. They've been, both been on the job four years uh, at the time. So they recruit, this one was recruited at age 24, so they were, they were 28 at the time of the shooting. Uh, this one was 25, so they're 29 uh, years old at the time of the shooting. Both male, both white, no prior officer-involved shootings, no, no prior force complaints, same rank, same assignment, same gun type, same caliber, everything's the same. The only thing that, that's different is the age at which they were recruited. And then in this moment, in this, in this shooting moment, uh, one officer shot three rounds while the other shot four rounds. All right. And so if this is the only information you had, you'd say, well, maybe there's uh, those officers that recruited a little older are a little <laughs> bit more likely to shoot. Now, based on one shooting, you're not going to you know, bet the bank on that. But given this information, that's sort of what, what, you'd, have to, what you'd have to go on. Um, so, and indeed, so the officer that, that uh, the, the officer that's one year older um, shot 1.3 times uh, more rounds. And so, pack this into, uh, into the, that likelihood for a single shooting. So this would be the one contribution for this one shooting to a, a, a likelihood that would multiply terms like this for everything else. Now, since they, they're equivalent on all other features, all the other betas disappear because there's no information on rank, caliber in this shooting because of those, they share all that information. So all of that cancels out. The only thing that's left is the one coefficient on recruit age. Everything else cancels out of the likelihood. So we can, we can draw this picture. That's why I, I like this, uh, this shooting in particular. So we can trace out the whole likelihood uh, and see, see sort of what it looks like. And we can find the spot where it's maximized. And it's right where recruit age, is, or e to the, that beta hat, is 1.3, which is exactly what we would think just by looking at the raw data that, that one, the, the older officer shot uh, 1.3 times uh, uh, more rounds as the younger officer. So that's just to walk through an example to, to show you that you get the common sense answer in a very simple uh, example. So let's get, let's get to some, some real data. So this is data from uh, NYPD. Um, I had, uh, working with uh, colleagues, including, including Terry, uh, we collected data from uh, NYPD, um, read all of the shooting investigations for th uh, three years, um, collected uh, information on who, which officers were at the scene the moment the shooting took, took place, and then I got all kinds of information on them. Uh, and uh, this was uh, in response to um, a direct request from uh, Commissioner Ray Kelly at the time. Uh, they wanted to know about the characteristics of officers, their training patterns, their experience, supervision, other factors that may help predict and thus pr uh, reduce uh, future firearm discharges. All right. Um, so let's get to some results. Uh, so uh, let's just take a look at the rank. Um, we do see uh, that. Uh, this is compared to the, the rank of police officer. Uh, detectives have about the same risk of, of shooting. Um, sergeants and lieutenants and above, the, the risk goes down. Okay, very sensible. I wouldn't, even if, if there's a sergeant on the scene, I would not expect them to be either, you know, first through the door or, or right, you know, right um, the one in the front, front line. Okay. Um, I can also, with the same data, look at the number of rounds fired and I still get you know, fairly uh, consistent uh, estimates or conclusions, I should say, uh, based on uh, studying the number of rounds fired. Uh, years at NYPD, uh, so those that were recruited when they were younger have a risk that appears to persist uh, even, even later. Um, so younger officers that recruited younger have, have higher risk. Uh, we can look at other features like the risk of uh, by, based by uh, race. I uh, found that black officers were much more likely uh, to be the shooters. And you can look at raw data on this too. You can look at all shootings involving both a black officer standing shoulder to shoulder with a white officer. And it's much more likely that the black officer shoots. Officers accumulating a lot of negative marks in their file. That's the CPI <laughs> points. Uh, you earn CPI points by doing 
things like losing your badge and gun, showing up late, but also things like crashing your car, um, having internal affairs investigations turn out uh, poorly for you, uh, and, other, and other things. Um, other things that didn't matter, uh, um, so uh, the sex of the officer, um, education uh, didn't seem to matter, and then I have lots of other things like their evaluation score, how good they did the last time they went to the range and, and shot, their, shot their gun, how many medals they got, uh, how many days of leave and how many times they were, uh, you know, uh, were injured on the, on the job, those sorts of things uh, didn't, didn't seem to matter. They weren't significant. Those effects are still big. Fair point. Well said. Um, all right. So I did the same analysis. I realize now there's a lot of numbers on the, t on the, on the slide. Uh, did the same analysis looking at the counts instead. So this is the decision to shoot, and this is sort of numbers of rounds. Uh, some, some things persist, like the uh, uh, black officer is still more likely to shoot. Uh, some of the other findings you know, uh, don't uh, appear to be as strong when looking at the number of rounds. Did you say whether this is uh, simultaneously estimated coefficients or are these? Yeah, it's all one, big, one, it's all one right. big likelihood to estimate all these. All right. So the, that's analysis I did some time ago, uh, published in uh, David Banks' journal, uh, Statistics and Public Policy, new journal. You should, you should consider contributing there. Did I say that right? <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, but it's, it's one city, you know, one, one time period. Um, and I'm, I've always wanted to find out if this was generalizable. I've gotten records from other uh, cities and I've looked at them, and in many cases, I can't tell who's on the scene at the time the shooting took place. Like, uh, you would, you, maybe this person showed up to direct traffic after the incidents, or one is one of the investigators, but I couldn't tell which ones were on the scene, so I haven't been able to replicate this in at least two other cities that I've, that I've looked at. But in talking to the police foundation, they've been, in collaboration with major city chiefs, they've been collecting all officer-involved shootings from 56 agencies across the US and Canada, um, and the, the full data set has uh, data on 2,500 officers involved in 1,600 shootings. Now, not all those shootings are useful for me uh, because they, many of them involve only one officer and that, those uh, provide no information for, for beta. Uh, in, um, in addition, they don't have the zeros. They don't have the people that were at, on the scene that didn't shoot, okay? But, it turns out that the likelihood, you can still derive a likelihood can, um, a trunk based on a truncated Poisson distribution rather than the full Poisson distribution. So given that you fired at least one round and X and Z, and, right, the factorization still works, but the computation becomes very hairy. But I, but I worked that one out over the course of uh, last summer. So I have some results on this as well. So uh, the take-home message here is I found nothing. Uh, so I mean, I mean, that is about as nothing as, as you can get. So years of experience had no effect on, uh, on number of rounds fired, age of recruitment, uh, nothing. Um, uh, looking down the list, uh, certainly no significant effects. Some things sort of fluctuate a little bit higher or lower. Uh, whether you had a, a prior uh, shooting, um, you know, a little bit elevated. If you've had two or more prior shootings, you're more likely to shoot again, uh, but uh, fairly large confidence intervals. Having prior force complaints, elevated, but have wide confidence intervals. Uh, the, the role at the scene, um, you know, again, I've got wide confidence, wide confidence intervals. Um, whether you use a long gun or a pistol, you know, that's essentially a one. Uh, so I really find, uh, no, found no effects in any of this. Now a wrinkle here is this, this method is data hungry in an environment that has very few incidents. So we kept waiting, and I would check in on the police foundation, uh, any more shootings this month? You know, like, <laughs> do we have any more? And it was, it, it was dark. <laughs> but uh, but it, was, it was just trying to get enough in there, and we said, okay, at this point, let's, let's go with it. We've got we to run something and at least demonstrate that, that, that you can do this. 
Um, now, a key thing is not only do you need office, multiple officers on the scene, but they also have to vary in their X's. Remember, those two officers were the same on everything, and so the only information that that particular incident uh, had, it told us a little bit about age and, and nothing else, or a recruitment age, nothing else. So I went through and looked at some of the things that I'm interested in, like a uh, special assignment. So I'm interested in knowing if officers with a special assignment uh, I, you know, provide some, some information. But uh, importantly, um, I have it, uh, special assignment officers were involved in 115 shootings, but for 70, 75 of those incidents, all of the officers on the scene were special assignment. And that makes sense, they sort of move you know, in, in a group to, to incidents. So that left uh, 40 incidents from which I could actually draw some information about that, that feature. So I, I think it's important that, the, the, that we use a method like this to be able to tease apart you know, what features uh, are necessary, but it's very data hungry and we just need more departments collecting the kind of information that would make, that would make this, uh, this possible. Uh, where's Jim? Uh, two, two minutes? Uh, yeah, you're done. 25 minutes you're at, so. Okay, give me, give me one, uh, give me, uh, uh, one, I'll skip this part then. So let me just get straight to the, the conclusions then. So uh, it, in order to make, it, to make this you know, uh, uh, useful, we just need to simply amass a lot more information, um, and particularly on things that, we, that, we're, that, we're, that we're interested in, like you know, having a prior force uh, complaint. You know, only 4% of shootings, well, I, I needed officers involved in shootings that had prior force complaints in order to get any information about that. So of all the shootings, only 4% had any information on this particular particular feature. Um, better standardized reporting. The great thing with the Police Foundation did is they got all these agencies, 56 agencies, to agree to collect information in this way and report it in this way so that they could synthesize across these departments. Without that, uh, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, so being able to standardize that. The last thing is the issue about being able to identify the officers on the scene. And as part of uh, Chicago PD's new consent decree, uh, they, this is actually written in because of the kind of research uh, that, I've, uh, that, I've, uh, that I did here uh, in other departments. Uh, the um, uh, Illinois Attorney General required that CPD units, uh, all CPD units be identified, those who are at the scene of any use of force incident. So if in the case, the future we're able to generalize this to not just to police shootings, but to other right. uses of force methodologies that are more common, um, this, uh, at least in Chicago, will be able to identify all of the officers that were at the scene uh, of any use of force incident. Okay. Thanks.